No, I think the biggest thing, like I said, as far as being a player's coach, um, is just telling them the truth. And um, I think a lot of people respect that. But are there coaches who won't tell players the truth? Well, and, and are they lying to them or are they just not withholding information? Well, some, it's some coaches that'll talk around <laughs> the problem. <laughs> talk around, like the show CP, video. CP turned the ball with five times in a row, and I come and say, hey, we need to stop turning. No, yeah. CP, you need to stop turning. No, that's, that's real. No, that's real. You that's real. Season six, the first one in Toronto, 2018? Yeah. Feels like a long, it actually does feel like a long time ago. Here's to season six. Let's make some more unforgettable moments. Only in the shop. Cheers. Cheers. Now, Missoula's not what he said. He should have, you never say I lost the locker room. What'd he say? Oh, he said that? They asked him if he lost a locker room. He said, I think so, and that's why I got to try to get it back. Yeah, you don't say that. You, <laughs> under, Coach, you know you never say that. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to die before I do. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to the grave with that one. But, I mean, but he's done a hell of a job, though, man. It's his first year. It's his first yeah. year. And and like you said, to take over a team that went to the finals last year, Emei did a great job. First time coaching, come from behind the bench. He's done a hell of a job. And just, they don't talk about how many, how many mistakes a player make in the game. <laughs> Like I said, coach makes one mistake or two mistakes, he gets fired. But a player can have seven turnovers, four for 15, four for 19. No, I'm that's saying, real. like, no, that's real. like it, don't, real. it don't make sense. Like, you just keep, you know, keep firing good coaches and keep blaming the coaches. Like, everybody gonna make mistakes. I don't care yeah. how you look at it. I, I you agree. can go into a series and be prepared, boom. But, like, you're gonna make a mistake. That happened to us this year against uh, uh, Sacramento. Uh, I think it was 157, 157, whatever that crazy, crazy score was. Game, we yeah. supposed to foul at the end of the game, but we didn't foul. You know, and so... You, you called for a foul? <laughs> we supposed to foul. <laughs> but then again, it's the coach, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so you look at it, you know, we're a foul team. We supposed to foul. We didn't foul. We supposed to stay at home. We didn't stay at home. But then you look at it, you know, I go to the press conference. I take the blame. You yeah. take the whole blame. Yeah, I don't care. Like, yeah. I don't care what people... I don't exactly. Care. Man, but I don't know if you... I hear one coach here on, in the shop speaking. I think I hear another coach... Here speaking. <laughs> no, he got too much money Any? to coach. <laughs> no. <laughs> when you make that kind of money, you don't want to yeah. do it. You don't you don't coach? No. Why? For what? I'm you an, an AAU coach. You love the, you love your coach. AAU coach. CP, you got 12 no players. interest in being an NBA coach when you're done playing. No. No. Zero interest. No. I can't. Honestly, I tell you, I don't want to travel like that. Got it. Man, got the great it. players, they don't have patience either. Yeah. Like the great players, they don't I have... I think great players can't... I think great players like him can't identify... Talent, because they just go like, yeah, they he, can't play. he can't play. He can't <laughs> no, play. I can't. I... If you sit and talk with him about who can play and who can't play, you're like, the f are you talking about? No, like, no, no, of no. course that guy can play. Like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Because he can't do the hardest thing ever. You like, no, I don't, it's I don't very think I, hard for great players I don't to think evaluate. I, man, I don't think players. I look at it like that just because I'm on the grassroots level, right? Like. It's a kid, job project. It's a kid that played in my AAU program. Might be one of the favorite kids I ever coached. It was a kid named Altariq Gilbert. He he never played in the league. He went on to UConn and played, but he just, especially when you're a guard, T, you know what I'm saying? Like when you're a guard and you're a coach, you just want somebody that got high basketball IQ. You know what I mean? You want him to have that, and you want him to have a dog. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You want him to be a go-getter. You know, you, and so I think that's, but that's why I love AAU, because you get a chance to actually mold kids at an early age. Because when we get to the NBA, we ain't trying to hear none of that. Right. <laughs> For real, you get to the NBA, I mean, I can't imagine coaching us because we feel like we know it. No chance I could do it. I met a great player. He's actually my favorite player. I got a call besides you, of course. But you wanted to play with him. He's a dope guy named Kobe Bryant. God bless his dad. I get a call from Tip in the middle of the night. He's like, hey. I'm like, what's up? It's actually, it's, it's, it's like just evening. He's like, hey. He say, Get down to the studio. I was like, for what? He said, because Kobe here, and I know you love him. <laughs> <laughs> I got up, and I, I took my wife. I made sure I hated him when we took the picture. I was like, LeBron's her favorite player. So I was, I was like, you like tall, I ain't taking no risk. 
And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's still time. I, I, I remember <laughs> asking Kobe, I was like, yo, I say, you, you finna retire on me. I say, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't really know who I'm gonna be like, yo, this the man, he's the go, he's gonna take it all this year. Who should I look to to follow? And um, he said, I'm gonna tell you, he said, it's this, it's this kid, if he can stay healthy, because he's he's skinny. And I'm looking at Kobe like, if nobody, you know, on the television side, y'all never seen him in person. He physically wasn't impressive. He was thin, real thin. I used to wonder, like, you be doing that on court? You look like a god on court. It looked like I could take you in a street fight. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and he was like, man, it's this kid. He said, I'm watching him. He says, but I think he's who you should follow. And I was like, who? He's this kid named Steph Curry. And that's when I started watching Stephen Golden State, oh, wow. and, and he is not disappointed. I was like, oh, my God. Like, of course. So Kobe is one of those greats who I think identified because he's, he reminded me of Hercules. Like, you know, he knew he wasn't, at some point, the god Michael Jordan, but he's, he's one of the players that I really saw have the desire to defeat his idol. And that's admirable to me. It's like, as a rapper, every time I get on with the Andre 3000 or with the Hove, or even with my rap partner, L, like, my goal is to be the most- Always. On that Always track. Always on and, the track. You want to deliver yeah, the best and, verse. But when I see it in a younger dude, too, I walk up to him like, hey, you got it. Like, all the red company saying, <laughs> I don't give a what your manager's saying about it. You got it, and don't lose it. Well, so we're talking about AAU, you don't just coach A. Did I read correctly? You had 12 NBA players from your AAU program? Yeah, we got 12. Uh, yeah, that's that's insane, insane, man. That's fucking insane. It's, that's a legacy thing. Wow. It's crazy, because I don't like to say kids, but they are. Like, because yeah. I coach them. I be with them during the summer or whatnot, um, and it's nothing like it. You know what I'm saying? One of my teammates, kid, Josh Okoge, that played with me, with, uh, you know Josh yeah, that played, yeah. uh, in Phoenix, he used to catch a Greyhound bus from Atlanta. Because y'all know AAU, whatever, the states got just got to touch. touch. Right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He used to catch a Greyhound bus to come down to my gym to come to practice. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, the dedication of it. And so my thing with my AAU kids is I just be trying to give them an opportunity it's awesome for you to do that because we, you know, we need it. Like, we had Lamar Jackson on the show um, a while back, and he was saying, which we all know, he was like, yo, there's so many guys from where I'm from that some could have been better than me, it definitely played on a level, but because of the people around them just didn't get there, right? So when you look at somebody like what Ja is going through, right, who's reached the top already, making money, but can't seem to... I don't know if it's the people around him or figure it out. What 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 is it that worked for all of us, Mike, Lakeith? What I think Lamonte it? Jones had an interesting perspective that you don't blame the people. Like if you look at that incident, I, I don't talk public. I'm I'm a gun guy. I'm I'm very pro second name. And I think that part of the problem with guns in the black community is I'm from the deep south. Like I'm from Atlanta, but my family's from Tuskegee, Alabama, Edenton, Georgia, places like that you get given a gun at 19 years old. So you're already accustomed to it. You get your first, you get a BB gun. You go out, you learn how to shoot something small. Anything you shoot, generally you're gonna eat. You know, so if you shoot a raccoon or a squirrel, you better be prepared to eat it. Otherwise, don't shoot it. So I believe when you look at a person like Ja, um, it's because his friend tried to save him. His friend saw the gun. Yeah, like, oh, put his phone on. Stupid yeah, shit. Yeah, get the exactly. phone out the way. That's a that's a good friend indeed. But I think that honestly, you it's hard to tell a 23 year old with 100 million dollars, you know, what to do. But to me, it's easier to get him in a Bass Reeves Gun Club or NAGA, which is National African American Gun Association, things of that nature. Because you know, you're excited. Boys are excited by warrior culture. Every boy doesn't play baseball or football or basketball. Some boys need to enjoy fishing and hunting and things of that nature. So I think if black people People as a culture, if we get quiet about commenting on each other every time we make a up, and if we focus on nine to 13 year old boys, getting them acclimated to being outside, getting them acclimated to doing like turkey hunting, things of that nature, the guns won't seem so exotic. So I think we need to embrace the up, say, okay, it was a up, but now this is how you direct that energy. So for me, if I was had a conversation with Josh, just like when you come to Atlanta, let's go through stutters. Let's let these old white guys teach us how to hold a gun because you should never hold a gun like that. That was the stupidest <laughs> shit I saw. So <laughs> I'm like, he gonna drop yeah, that. That was the part that scared the Yeah, I'm saying, like, that's the part that scared the shit out of me. That's I'm just true. like, this finna shoot itself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, be, having success, being polarized, being famous is something that requires a certain level of maturity, understanding and experience to deal with. And it's the same thing with weapons and guns. It's a respect and an education thing. And I think we should be instilling within our youth 
what that education is, what that looks like, what responsibility looks like yielding these tools that can be so devastating or can save your family. It's all about the person wielding them and, and the psychology um, within that person, I think. Understand exactly what you guys are saying, but there's also like he's part of the NBA and there's an image that the NBA wants to have that he has to think about that part, right, too. So like, co Coach, when you have young guys, is that like a conversation in a locker room with guys sometimes about like, you're not a part of the NBA, you play for the whatever team, the Clippers. <laughs> that ain't your job. Is it, do, you, I mean, do you think that's part of your job or not? That's well, I question. do. I think, I think it's different. I think, um, you know, as, as an ex-player and being a coach now, when you see younger guys that, you know, you can try to help, you know, I think that, um, like, okay, I saw, you know, some things that wasn't right, you know, just trying to help that younger kid out. Like, when you get older, 30s, like, see, you know, I ain't, you know, see, they grown. <laughs> they you know grown. what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. like, you know, you got Bones Highland, Brandon Boston, those type of guys. Young guys, guys. Yeah. you, you, you pull them aside. Yeah, pull them aside, like, listen, man, like, you know, you you grown because you're a man. Once you make it to the NBA, like, you become a man, you know, yeah. fast. Whose job is it, CP, then? Yeah. If it, like you said, that his job. Whose job does... You know, it's crazy because T. Lou is unique in that he just a player's coach. <laughs> you know what I mean? It don't matter if you 35 or if you 20, you're just going to respect T. Lou because he played because of the way he come at guys. But I tell you, it's so crazy because uh, I'm a big Ja fan, right? Lil' Chris had a... You know him, bro? <laughs> so Ja came to my basketball camp, right, when he was in college, and he came into camp. Nobody really knew who he was like that. And after camp, everybody knew who he was. <laughs> that's when, he blew, that's, that's when yeah. he blew up and all the NBA scouts. And I'm going to tell you, Lil' Chris just had an AAU tournament this weekend, and he was playing in Ja's shoes, so... I always say, like, me, Braun, some of the older guys, we have a unique perspective in the league because we still play, right? So we in the locker room with the younger generation, and we got kids that's their age. Oh, yeah. You know, I got teammates that's closer in age to little Chris than they are to me. Of course. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. But it's so dope because it, like, keeps me young. And what I, what I say about Ja and just me being in the league in my position as president for the union for so long is that Everything that you guys just said is so real, but it happens so fast, right? At night, I came in the league when I was 19. But I had $151 in my bank account as a college student. Wow. I declared for the draft, got an agent. The agent offered me $100,000 upfront money, right? Luckily, I had two parents who right. was like, that's too damn much, <laughs> right? But they said $25,000, cool, right? So you know what happened? I was at Wake, right, in Winston. I went to the bank right up the street just so I could see what uh, the statement looked like, <laughs> yeah. right? Because yeah. we, we young, course. we don't, yeah. we don't know. Yeah. We ain't never had no money like this. Yeah. I went and got the statement that said 25,151. <laughs> <laughs> right there, though. No education came along with it, mm -hmm. right? First thing I did, I went to the mall. Of course. Took my girl to the mall, Jay Gray and his girl. Went to the mall, we went to the... Ball. What? Ball. What? Ball. what? Ball. We went to the we went to, we went to the clothing Ball store. The we went to the clothing store. I said, everybody get you something. <laughs> right? At 19, now everybody looking at you as being the head of your household. That's what I said. You grew up. Or your cool. family. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And now also you want me to try to be the best basketball player I gotta be. And I gotta learn how to deal with the media. And I got everybody asking me for this and that. You know what I'm saying? So I like, I mean, I we we'll love to talk to Ja. Well, yeah, job you know what I'm saying? Help? Huh? Whose job is the help? Whose actual job is It's not the coach. Is it, is it, it's not really the GM. Is it your family? Is it your It's agent? your job to seek help, too. Yeah, like, like, yeah. Like, yeah. That's it, a good point. Yeah, you got to, like, even though you're young, you got to understand, I don't, I, you don't have to have all the answers, but I do have a responsibility because yeah. you have people that are looking at you and you have people that, that you're going to be responsible to lead. So... Yeah. I think you're supposed to seek mentorship, and I think that older black men in particular should offer mentorship. And yes. mentorship to people who are on the internet and on IG is not something to charge you $30,000 to give you advice. <laughs> mentorship is free. The $30,000 is a consulting fee, and if I pay you a consulting fee, I better damn well see some results. You better deliver yeah. 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 listen, listen, Financial you, literacy. Oh, you're no, it's quite nice. No, Go ahead, go ahead. It's so important. It's so important for our youth and for, you know, young black men to know. And mentorship is a real thing. I, I was walking out of the mall one time, and this, this dude come up to me. I think I was like 20-something, like 25 or something. He come up, and he's like, 
Hey, man, you know, I, I, I appreciate your work. I'm, I'm an actor, and I, I want you to be my mentor. And I thought it was weird because I was like, it's grown. Like, why are you telling me? <laughs> but I just had never had that happen to me before, and I didn't know what a mentor was. I didn't have one. I didn't know that that was a thing that could be a thing. And, you know, after I ruminated on it and thought about it for a while, I was like, damn, I could be a mentor. And I understood what that connection actually meant. It's exchange of information and us helping each other and, 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 and being a stepping stone for each other to get the knowledge before we got to learn it the hard way. Yeah. And I think our community could use a lot more of that, like, you know, interchanging and transferring information, especially upon the youth when it comes to being financially literate. I remember I got my first check. It was How crazy. It was like, I, I was grown at this point. I was like 20, but I hadn't seen that kind of money before. <laughs> um, and it was like, you know, I got like, it was like maybe $130,000 in a check or something like that. And it was just crazy. And it was like this car that I really wanted, you know, like, I, and it was just like, that was the only thing that was on my mind. Like, I have to get this car. And, you know, I didn't have credit. I didn't have anything. I walked into the dealership with a duffel bag full of money yeah. and just set it on the counter. Like, here is, is an exact amount for how much the car costs. And then they, they counted all the shit out. And I'm sitting there watching them count it out. And then I, I drove off the lot and I was broke. So I had my call. But you had your call. And I, of course, learned the value in learning how to, you know, spend and use your money because then I'm struggling for the check. I mean, I'm struggling for my rent the next week and trying to figure it out. I was like, this has to be backwards. But if I had someone that was a mentor, someone to tell me, someone to just reach out to and say, hey, that's not how you spend your money, that would have been very, very helpful. But here's the challenge. You don't know what you don't know at that age. Like the other thing, too, you got to be vulnerable. You got to be willing to tell people what you don't know because some people have just talked to you, but they haven't done the homework or done the research. T, what year was that when we was with the Clippers? 13, I think. It was a while ago. But uh, me and T. Lou got real close, like real fast. And when you got a coach like that, that you respect his opinion, and what they say in the league, they say that's like the furthest two inches between like being an uh, assistant hey, coach yeah. or a head coach yeah. or not. But T. Lou, Man, our team changed drastically when he left because he just shot it to a straight. You know what I'm saying? Regardless if you wanted to hear it or not, whatnot, T. Lou was like that, and I appreciated that. I respected that. I mean, I ain't played for him as a head coach, but I'm sure he's still the same way. Like, you can see the way you sitting over there on the sideline. <laughs> no, T. Lou, I, 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 I think the biggest thing, <laughs> no, I think the biggest thing, like I said, as far as being a player's coach, um, is just telling them the truth. You know, a lot of times they be like, you know, cuss you out, whatever, be, might be mad, but if they real with themselves, tomorrow they come back, like, you know what, you was right. You know, and so all I can do is just tell you the truth. And um, I think a lot of people respect that, you know, just the is communication. Is there some coaches who won't? Oh, yeah. I, I've heard Brian talk about his coaches, they won't hold a guy accountable. It's a lot. I hate that word. What is that? Tell me what, tell me what that means to you. Is there, but are there coaches who won't tell players the truth? Well, and, and are they lying to them or are they just not withholding information? Well, it's some, it's some coaches that talk around the problem. <laughs> talk around, like the show CP, video. CP turned the ball with five times in a row and I come and say, hey, we need to stop turning. No, yeah, CP, yeah, you need yeah. to stop turning. No, that's, that's real. No, that's real. Yeah, that's real. Yeah, yeah. Some, some coaches will show films yeah. and stuff and be like, look, I deep. I, our defense got to be better. What well, Coach, they just going to his ass. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but T, T wasn't like that. And uh, I, I, you don't I, do it like that. I, I've nah. had teammates, and T know, I, I had teammates, too, that when he was like that, they ain't like it. Yeah. They, oh, they didn't like it. Well, because you talking straight at him. Like, yeah. man, if you f*** this up. Right. But it ain't, it ain't personal like that. It of ain't always it at you yeah. either. You know what I mean? But I'm, I'm also a player that's like that. I'd much rather have a guy on my team sort of tell me, like, during the game, if I get, like, three turnovers or something like that, be like, damn, see, take care of the ball. You know what I'm saying? Like, I like that energy. But sometimes you do. I know I could get it. I, th I don't know. I never played on an NBA team with you, but I can watch the film. Sometimes it's also, like, if you turn over to us, I'm like, damn, see, stop turning over. You're like, I know I'm turning over. Well, yeah, like, you exactly like, relax. right. Relax, I you, know. You exactly you go, you'd stay exactly in the right. obvious. And, I don't you know wanna, what? It I don't want to turn the ball over. It, it, might, it might not have to be about a turnover. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, like, I, I want a guy that got that same energy that I got. And I didn't always say this as a player. Like, I never ask my teammate to do something that I won't do. You know what I mean? So if I'm, if I'm some defense or something like that, I want a guy who passionate and, like, who going to tell me. You know what I'm saying? Book like that. 
You know, that's why I think we've gotten along so well because we competitive and I know that person want to win just as bad as I want to win. And, and T was like that as a coach, but everybody ain't necessarily like that. Sports. I think when you say, yeah, coach. I'm sorry, no, players no. coach, like you can't pull nothing, you can't get nothing over on me. Like I'm mm. from the streets, just like you from the streets. Like you go into the club, all right, cool. Like I just be ready to play tomorrow. Right? Yeah. Like you got right. some coach, oh, they went out last. I don't no. believe in that. Like yeah. because- We grown. Because you, grew, you played and you know motherfuckers go well, out. Well, I'm saying, what's the difference between the front office people going out the night before, going to dinner, drinking wine all night, and then come back to the hotel at 12, 30, 1 o'clock, and the guys go to the club. It's just like, y'all doing, y'all drinking, you're doing the same thing. Yeah. It's just you didn't go to the club. So like, yeah. I don't, like, I understand what y'all doing. So like, don't try to lie, don't try to get over on me. So when they say players coach, it's like, I think more so can relate to the guys, be truthful with the guys, but I ain't gonna never say like, don't go out. Like, you gotta enjoy it. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's a short window. Like, people think, oh, NBA, man, it's a short window. And so, and the biggest yeah. thing I hate about the word accountability is you got 15 guys in the locker room. What's y'all accountability? Don't keep saying the coach, oh, the coach didn't. You see the same thing I see. <laughs> and, you make, and you make $50 million a year, but, and you can't get fired. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm gonna call a guy out, but like, y'all in the locker room every day, you see a guy messing up. You tell him you too. You tell him. All of us are grown enough to, we could actually be coaches at a high school Tell or something me. like that. So why don't we talk about what we see and then when the coaches come in, they gonna talk to us too. It all, it, it's best when it's collaborative, man, yeah, in anything that. that you do. Yeah. I mean, is that? it the same thing on set with it actors is, and directors? It is the exact same way. And there's so much about what athletes do that I identify with being an artist on set. There's, there's just so much internal competition with yourself to, to be better. And it requires a, you know, a certain regimen of, you know, getting your lines down, getting the character down, study, um, you know, just a relentless effort and dedication, but it is teamwork. It's a set of hundreds of people and everyone has their expertise that comes together to pull off the illusion, to create the magic and everybody has to be on their P's and Q's. It is absolute teamwork and we gotta be able to pass the, the, the spiritual rock. I wish I knew so much more about sports here. You guys talk about <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm listening, man. I do it's commercials all, it's and stuff. All, it's all the same, though. Oh, yeah. It's the same. It's, it's the same. Like, like, say you how do you remember, remember all the lines? You should right, remember right, right, right. Coach, Coach Lou one day, you'll realize it's the no, same it's, thing. It's the same. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. It's the same. Hey, look, Chris said he knows when he's had three turnovers in a row. Do you know when you're turning the rock over and you're filming something, you're like, I'm messing this thing up, man. Yeah. In the moment, do you know that yes yes it's you know it's it's some a lot of times it's much more than lines uh what it what it typically is is you being prepared enough to be sort of situated in the story the, the correct way and we all got to help each other and sometimes you'll stumble and not be prepared but part of what it means to show up is to be prepared you got to know your lines if you're showing up to set with papers I don't even know how you got here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm very confused if that's happening, so. That would be you know. me. Uh, I'm like, I, I'm like, I don't do it, man. Yeah. I, got, I, man. I always wanted to go to a set, man. man. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, Listen, never. Oh, oh it's trippy, man. I always man. wanted to go it's check it out, man. It's trippy. I mean, I ain't did all the movies and stuff, but I've been doing these commercials for a long time, right? Very for, for, long, for, for a long time. time. So, yeah. so it's crazy, but, roles, but, so. but for me, it's crazy, like, to hear that because everything you just said was so real because, like, I've been on set now doing all these things, and people come on set, and they be like, uh, Mr. Such-and-Such, can we talk to you? What? <laughs> like, I, I'm a human. Talk to right. me like a human. Yeah. But what he just said was crazy because this is the thing that makes me mad, like, when you're on set. You'll, like, be in between shots, and the director or something like that will be right there, and then, like, the talent agency, they'll come over and like tell the director, can you tell him that we need him to talk a little bit louder? <laughs> yeah, I'm standing right there. <laughs> Just say it to me. I'm standing right there. Yeah, and I'm like, uh, excuse me. Is, is, you, you yeah, the ad agency. Yeah. That's what yeah. they uh, excuse me, can you tell me? I'm, I'm <laughs> I can hear you. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. I asked questions and they said that there are some like actors and actresses who will be on set and only like one person is allowed to talk to them yes. Yes. to yes. give them yes. feedback. Mm -hmm. If you need me to talk louder. Right. It is yeah. really crazy the lengths people will go through to be passive aggressive in certain fields and not be able, not, not directly tell you what they feel in, but in some roundabout way, get it across to you. This is a very, I feel like it's contract language translated in real time. It's, it's like- <laughs> That's what it is, it's, yeah, it's, That's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. 
it's the fine print, and people will, uh, they'll allude to things without telling you directly what it is to save face. This is a very fear paradigm, like, um, you know, being an artist and being an actor. You exist in a fear paradigm. I, I started at the bottom of it when I first came into acting. I was playing smaller roles. No one knew who I was, really. And so you're kind of at the bottom of that pecking order. And as you work your way up, you start to see the way in which people interact with you. It sort of changes, and you become the special person, and you become the person that is coveted and held at the top at a certain point. And because I've been through all of the different layers, I can see the stark difference. And it doesn't feel good to me to have preferential treatment. And it doesn't feel good to me to have people being fake in front of me or treating other people wrong and then treating me nicely. And somehow I'm supposed to feel that that is a good thing. But I feel like the entertainment industry can sometimes be a place where there's just a lot of going on. There's a lot of, there's a <laughs> lot of way, fake, and there's a lot of things where people aren't being direct and being honest, and I wish that there were more people that would be honest, but it's, it's all about the people who populate well, it. We also got to say entertainers are frail as too. Like, you, got, you, you, <laughs> that, you know, that at a certain point, you know, we, um... That's part I, of being an entertainer. So my man Bear is with me today, right? People always assume Bear is my security. I'm like, nah, you know, I mean, he can fight. You know, we, <laughs> we, we gonna make it out. You know, even a kung fu practitioner wrote to him in boxing, like, we gonna make it out of whatever jam we in. But I, I keep Bear with me um, because he's my, you ain't. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. like when I leave out of the room, oh, Mike, you were amazing. Right. Mike, you were so articulate. Mike, you were. We get out by some. <laughs> but an old West Side. And I love that about him because it, it oftentimes the most valued person in the king's court is a jester. Because the only person who could tell the king a joke, because I mean the truth, because he's telling him as a joke. Right. And I, I know it's a lot of times it's entertaining. Now, you have to inflate, you build Damn, a I character. Like the Killer Mike is a character that a nine-year-old boy named Michael created. So I drop a record next month, right? It's, it's, it's called Michael. It's me, a goofy nine-year-old kid, flyaway collar, buck teeth. But I created this character based on Scarface, based on Ice Cube, based on Ice-T. You know what I mean? I created this. So it's, it's, there have been times where I've let my temper get the best of me before a show. And mm -hmm. I have to walk back to security after the show like, hey, man, I'm sorry, dog. <laughs> I, I was being a so I just wanted to make sure my sister could get to the state. And me and security <laughs> dap it up. Now, growth is shown because last night, <laughs> shouts out to Brian, who was security working the door. I'm like, Brian, we can't be turned. Some of these people, these white folks paying me a lot of money, Brian. We can't just turn these people away. Hey, I need some grace from you. What are the rules? If there are 10 people in the room, then I'll exit three out if I need to bring three in. But I need you to let Brian know that it's OK to show me some grace. Within an eight-minute conversation, man, by the end of that you conversation, me and Brian were ace. Now, the 27-year-old Michael. You feel disrespected. Yeah, we're like, you tell me, you know what I, mean? I would have had to come back like, man, I'm sorry. I got tired of saying I'm sorry. So I said, let me get this on the front end. And, 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 and that was one of those times where the growth is shown. And right after that, Bear came to me and said, you still ain't. <laughs> yeah, but you got to kind of not be too. You got to have that part. You got to be and not be. And we come in multidimensional packages. Absolutely. <laughs> how, how, how long you been rapping? You started rapping at I rapped since, since I was nine years old. So. Wow. Yeah, wow. I, I, started, I, started, I started rapping professionally at 27. I took, I knew I could do it for real at about 14, 15. I remember the first time my homies took me to a studio. What made you know you could do it for real? The first thing I realized was all my friends were better than me at something. So I had to find something to be good at, right? Yeah. And at about 15, I remember rapping and the studio owner said, who is, who is that kid? And that's when I realized, I said, I finally found my football, my basketball, my baseball. Like, I, I'm that good at it. And man, they just kept pushing me. My friends kept pushing me. When I first wanted to press up my first mixtape, my friend Robert Hicks said, got drafted by the Buffalo Bills, 97. I can remember Rob, Rob knew if I, would, if, I, if I had to figure it out, I was going to get a pound of weed. And I was going to go figure out getting it, getting by this dime, equipment. Go dime for dime. Yeah, yeah, he knew. <laughs> he hit me. He said, hey, big fella. And he'll still hit me to this day. Like, don't ever complain about your job. Because God gave you what you wanted, so don't complain. But he said, I'm about to send you something. And he sent me a few grand just to press up the tape. I remember the, going to the bank to get it with the check he sent me. And the lady said, back there like, ooh, your friend got a lot of money. I was like, yeah, that Rich. <laughs> and not understanding that he wasn't at the time, but so it meant even more to me that he did that. But after that, I just never looked back. I just never looked back because my friend who had used his talent to go pro gave me financial aid to use my talent to go pro, and I never took that for granted. Mike, if, if there's one thing that you could tell young Mike, 
that nine-year-old, yeah. what would it be? What is gonna work? Oh, boy, it's gonna work in a big way. Boy, you gonna have a big house. You gonna have all the old school cars you ever wanted. Boy, fine women gonna come to your shows. Your girl gonna be so hot. Like, it's hard to convince a child something's impossible. Mm. And I it's believe that- It's hard to convince that a child that something's, yeah, something's impossible. That's true. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. To, you can't convince a child that, that, they, can't. that they can't fly. Right. Otherwise, you don't have the right brothers. So just eliminate the impossibility and let the child figure it out. Yeah. Let the child fall. Let them stumble. Let them, let them have to figure it out. But encourage. My mother didn't put me in the studio. She just said, yeah, you want to be a rapper? <sighs> Get you a rapper. Because <laughs> <laughs> she was only 16 years older than me. She was like, nah, you can be a rapper. So when I got the opportunity, I didn't think it was impossible. I, I thought possible. So that nine-year-old kid, I'm just going to say, you know, don't stop. But don't turn down opportunities to do other things. Right. You know, don't turn down the opportunity to learn to do something else. Even if you aren't the best at it, you've been exposed to it. Straight and that's up. a beautiful thing. There's nothing more beautiful than a, than a well-traveled human being. What about you? That, that question for you. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I resonate a lot with the imagination of the child. When I was young, I mean, there was nothing I thought that I couldn't do. Um, I was just very curious and mischievous and... I had people in my life, I didn't, I didn't have a father, but I had a lot of women in my life who allowed me to be expressive and allowed me to, I would throw on my aunt's wig and dance around in the mirror when I was really young and uh, told me that it was okay and it was a safe space to be expressive. And it, that was really important in, in my formative years to know that it was okay to do that. Kids, kids don't have all of the like, the jadedness that we come along with, the, the failures and the years of trying to do things and not following through, they are balls of potential. And uh, you got to, I, I kind of want to say you got to pass that rock, but I don't feel like that's appropriate to say. <laughs> you got to encourage them to shoot the ball. You got to encourage them to shoot the ball. You got to encourage them to shoot the ball. I do, I do want, I want to ask something, you know, I'm hearing a theme here, right? It's probably safe to say every single person in this room has been blessed to make more money than you ever thought you were going to make when you were nine, right? Mm -hmm. But I hear, like, the uh, desire to help, the desire to share information. We've talked about organizing, you know, the word activism. Like, why is that important to you all? You guys have made your money. You don't need to do anything. You can sit back and do the well, thing. Well, I still got to work. I'm just Negro rich. <laughs> yeah, I, ain't, I ain't white folk rich, but I'm on my way. You know? <laughs> I live below my means. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, like... When you're a kid or whatnot, and I know a lot of stuff come back to financial literacy, but when you was a kid growing up, you always said, man, if I get a million dollars, everybody going to be good. Ooh, Until you Back really, then you were, though. Yeah. Back then it was. It was close. Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. back then you get a million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. And so now, I agree. knowing the people that you know, you, everybody I'm sure here know billionaires, right? Absolutely. That work every day. Yeah. <laughs> that work every single day. Yeah. And so I think at a certain point, too, uh, exposure is the big word that I'm hearing. That's what you learn. Yeah, the key word in activism, I think, is active. You want to be active. You know, a lot of people figure that, you know, posting something online, an update, a tweet or something like that, and that's how you, you know, that's your form yeah. of activism. And by the way, that has its uses. But I think being on the ground floor, talking to people, mm. um, you know, really, you know, spreading knowledge across, spreading wealth across, and doing that in a way that can help people mobilize and get up on their own two feet, I think is what's important. So experience is really an important part of the activism and taking people out of their comfort zones and putting them in places where they can learn things. I remember when I first came to, to LA, I had never had wine before. And, you know, I, I was, I think I was like 19, 20, I, you know, I came to LA and, and uh, I was sitting at a table full of actors in this movie that I was in. And the waiter came over with a bottle of wine. You know, they show you the wine. <laughs> I never knew that they showed you wine. So when they showed me the wine, I grabbed it and took it to the head. <laughs> and everybody oh, was looking at me like, what the hell going on? I'm like, why y'all ain't? Because cause where I'm from, we, you know, we used to steal bottles and then we would like break the lock off and then pass it around and everybody drinking it. So I'm thinking like, oh, you, you know, this is the <laughs> You passing me the bottle. <laughs> These and I are learned funny. the hard way. I would have been pissed off. I ain't gonna lie. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like it's your mouth fall on it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, the other thing. Get a straw or something. You put your mouth all on it. Yeah, it, was, it was crazy, but I literally didn't know no better. I had to learn, you know, different etiquettes. I hadn't had sushi before. So I was like, y'all eat raw fish? They're like, yeah. You know, you dip it in the thing and chopsticks, <laughs> I'm using them like this. <laughs> but it's like, you know, you learning and being exposed to those things, you find out they're not really too much different than than what you know. The don't game know don't, you don't really know. change. Totally. It's really just 
you just, it's just molding into a different game. So like oftentimes I bring some of my homies in, bring them on set, act as an assistant or whatever, but you haven't acclimated to the climate yet. As I told you, the climate is weird. How important is that, right? Like spreading the knowledge. You have a book coming out, you know, lessons. Like how, how important is spreading the learnings, the failures, the lessons? And it's timing too. It's time and figuring out when you're ready to like sort of tell that story. Um, I wrote a book, man, and I tell you, you know, if anybody else that never did that, it's one of the craziest processes ever, ever. And I literally went on an emotional roller coaster because um, it's called Lessons from uh, Papa. My grandfather got murdered my senior year in high school, right, by uh, five teenagers. And my granddad was my best friend. I mean, that was my my right-hand man. I lost my grandmother when I was eight, and my grandfather, he had the first black-owned service station in North Carolina. So in my book, I'm talking about that, and through the process of writing the book, some of the stuff I hadn't talked about. You had to relive it a bit. I had to relive it, and I did the audio for my book, too. So it was one thing writing it, so I got videos of when I was doing the audio book of, like, just breaking down, you know, because it's like therapy, right? They tell black people, don't, man, you don't need to talk to about nobody, but this was like therapy for me. You know what I mean? So in my book, I talk about all of that. So it's dope to be able to tell your story. You know what I mean? So people, you know what I mean, get a chance to see the, the good and the bad. Oh, that's that comes amazing. With it. That's and amazing. you mentioned therapy. Everybody get a therapy. Everybody <laughs> do therapy. I think it's really, it's really important and gives you perspective. Like someone, literally what my therapist does is she'll, she's amazing. And I wish I could plug her can't <laughs> but she will lead you she will always lead me back to myself I'll say a bunch of crazy you know a bunch of things I'm going through the things that I'm thinking I'm thinking and she might even just sit there and be like now what do you think I'll be like now that I said it <laughs> there's another perspective that I have about it and there's something nice about having that bounce board that's skilled and has the tools to bring you back to yourself and that's what I like about the book too it's like you open up that chamber being vulnerable and I think you reap a lot of dope benefits from doing that. And, and, and the more we can encourage each other to do that, I think the better. Before we get out of here, Lakeith, I want to ask you, you obviously, he talked a lot about Atlanta. He talked a bit, you played Atlanta. You obviously on the show that represents Atlanta. What, is, what does that place mean to you? Mm. The first time I went to Atlanta, I was um, very pleasantly surprised to see that everyone there was black. I didn't know such a place existed in uh, in the U.S. And, you know, I, you know, I'm from San Bernardino, which is right, you know, a little hour 30 north of here, L.A. And it is, you know, you, you got a lot of different influx of cultures, but you don't see black people populating in, in like, you know, the bankers, they're working at the airport, they're, you know, everywhere you go, there's a black person that's employed there. And I just thought it was really beautiful. And it made me feel like, wow, the potential of what, you know, black people can be when we're congregated together and, the, the, and what we can accomplish together. And to, to, to be on this show that was like a real, you know, like we were, we're taking the black experience and kind of like trying to polarize it and make it digestible and understandable to people that may not understand it. And also lend voices to those who, you know, feel how it feels to be black and exist and be black. And what I was really inspired by was Donald, you know, having come from the area and having, you know, been able to get to a point where he was able to bring his city back and express his city to the masses um, through his perspective. And that was something that I thought was real special and that more of us should be doing. It's taking ownership of our narrative and him being the one that's pinning it. It's like nobody else is telling us what blackness looks like. This is coming uniquely from a black man. You know, you get a lot of scripts and it's written by other people who don't live our experience and they want to tell us what being black is, which is also why I think it's important to be selective. We need to get your point of view man, on that. I, I advise all players um, and Athlete, well, athletes and, and artists that I meet, I say buy something in Atlanta. I say I don't I don't mm. buy a house for your baby mama, why, your why? mama. Why Just, Atlanta? Well, why? I have a house in Atlanta. Why Atlanta? Because you're not playing from a defensive position. Atlanta's more than just a black city. It's it, it's a city. 1906, there was a huge riot there, right? Um, a, something gets worked out between the white class and the black class to say, hey, we're going to be a southern city that destroys itself. And at this time, it's, it's known for trains. Trains are coming through here. All the commerce that comes to the southeast, all the freight is coming through there. And they're like, yo, we can't do this again. So the, the, the first black millionaires, people like um, 
Alonzo Herndon, who started with barbershops that was all black barbers, but only served white businessmen. And then he learned about insurance. He said, well, we don't have life insurance and insurance. So he became, he started getting, becoming a broker for insurance. Built the largest, and this is now again, this is like 1900, early 1900, built the Atlanta Life Insurance Company. Atlanta has always been this peculiar, this peculiar cooperation between blacks and whites. William Hartsfield, white mayor, understood that aviation was the future. Trains weren't going to be the future. Gave Delta like a 50-year contract for a dollar a year. They ran them out of town, ridiculed them. But that contract made us a huge Delta hub. You see black people leading from the woman that put me on the billboard at Delta up there who leads their marketing to the woman, to the people who literally, when you land a plane, unless you're going to Jamaica or Africa, you don't see all black crews. And I would like to see more black people and white people who are truly allies and co-conspirators to bring your to Atlanta, make a real investment, and help this city grow so that we may be the prototype for what we want to see other cities throughout the South become. Can you talk about all my businesses? <laughs> <laughs> that was beautiful. No, really. That's like put your money where your mouth is. You talked about being selective. Your next film is Hunted Mansion, which is a scary, very scary movie, right? What was that like? Because that's kind of yeah. different than most of the things I've seen you do. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was um it was a Disney movie. So for me, just the scale was different than anything I had experienced before. Um, day one, I'm taking a walk with the with the CEO of Disney, the guy who is the Mr. Disney guy. <laughs> one thing that I found quite striking was that his shoes were, they were just some dusty, like, old Nikes. And I was like, <laughs> he's wealthy. <laughs> if there's any indication that you're wealthy, is that you're not worried about what kind of shoes you got on, because it really don't matter. They're used specifically for utility. And... He, it was a really, it was a beautiful gift, the experience. I never experienced anything like that. Um, and it, it, was, it was really beautiful working with all these great people, like, you know, Danny DeVito. I, I grew up watching him I and, and never would have thought. He's a great man, by the way. Yeah, he's so cool, he's a man. He's cool dude. And, yeah, so fun. And, and, and it was just, it was, you know, Owen Wilson, and all these dope people, Chase Dillon, working with all of them, and Justin Simeon, who's our director, who's black. It was like dope. We was both, I'm cast as a lead in a Disney movie. And I'm black, and he's the director, and he's black. So we go into his office one day, and we're just looking at each other. We're like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> like, but it was dope that we had, we had got to that position, and we wanted to try, and if we could, maintain some integrity in blackness in them spaces, because we know in a lot of times, it's just not represented that way. So we want to make sure everywhere we could, you know, put a little, put a little bit of black in there. So when I came in to do the role, they said, what you want your hair to be? And I said, dreads, you know, and, and, and you know, first people kind of like dreads. And I'm like, just trust me. And so they put the dread wig on me and they're like, oh, dreads, it's dreads. And I'm like, yeah, it's the little things we got to do to put ourselves in positions to be seen in our many multifaceted ways. I don't even really like to call them dreads. I'd rather call them locks because that has a negative connotation. Well, I get to ask one selfish question yeah. every episode, and it's for you, Mike. You have a project coming out? Yeah, I have a project named Michael coming out on July 16th, interestingly enough, on Pac's birthday. And, and rumor, so first, congrats on that. And rumor has it you got one of my favorite artists, one of your favorite artists, Andre 3000. To yeah, Stax and Future jumped on a Talk to us about that. Like, I'm Dungeon interest? Family. We're Dungeon Family. I'd always wanted Dre on something. I'd sent him stuff over the years. He'd be like, Kill, that's hard, man. That's hard, but um, I just don't feel like rapping right now, Kill. <laughs> it's just like, God damn, Dre, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just then lost my thing for it, Kill, you know? But you know, I don't, you know. And he said, I came out here, I flew, no ID executive produced the project, and, and I learned so much working with him. It was, it was like playing under a player's coach. You know, it truly was time. And Dion says to me, he says, um, I got to show you how to use pros. And I'm like, you talking about a problem? I got the hottest mixtape in Atlanta. Nah, no, we gonna make this an album. So he says, I asked him, I said, can Dre come in and hear it? He said, like, yeah, Dre comes in, hears it. And this time I'm like, I'm not asking Dre. I can't take another note. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and Dre comes back. He said, Kill, I wanna leave you something. I said, what? He left a bunch of records. He said, you know, pick what you like. I said, for, like, that I like for you. He said, no, no, for you, for you. I said, you gotta get on my project. <laughs> you know, I turned into like a girl. You're gonna get on. Well, what did he like? He like you like beats? What was it? Beats, beats and, and and verses, just different ideas. Here, as artists, you never stop yeah, creating. Course, you always yeah. have ideas. But he sent he sent two scientists and engineers, and he sent uh, another that we he ended up taking back. And then we did another record that's gonna drop in the future. But scientists and engineers, he dropped it, and I'm just like, oh. 
Um, okay. It's some Dre 3000. Okay, I'm gonna have to rap this beat. Uh, okay. My cuz, like you looked at me and said, I don't give a what it sound like, cuz. We doing this rap. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny because there's evacuation protocols that, that, that essentially made sure <laughs> The essential cast was safe. <laughs> Y'all was gonna be good. It was the white folks that had to worry. It, 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 yeah, it they were like, gonna be like, man, I had him in my house. We protect him, man. We ain't let nobody kill him. Shout he here now. Get go like, look, he tell him what's up, my <laughs> I'm like, just do what he said, man. <laughs>